Welcome to the Moonshot Podcast, the podcast where we explore business growth, inspire innovative marketing strategies, and explore the world of company culture. Now here are your hosts, serial entrepreneurs and best-selling authors, James Philip Arbuckle and Kane Carpenter. You know that part where Chamath mentions lies as a service? Yeah. I was like, shit. I know a few people that could get really rich. <laughs> Lying in the service. <laughs> I know some people that'd be good at this. Like, oh, man. People are uh, a little bit different these days. Um, I did see, uh, you're talking about media rifts. Did you just see the UPS dropped off yeah. like 10, 12,000? 12,000, 12, yeah. yeah. Like, hey, we talked about this on an old podcast, and you look at, I mean, we were talking about that two years ago, how this, it's not sustainable as we, as I say, they, they pumped into seven trilly and, <laughs> you know, consumerism, we bought all this stuff. We, we shipped it, we bought it and it showed up, we used it, we donated it, we threw it out. We probably bought it again, threw it out again. And it wasn't going to stay forever. And I just wonder how long before we, if that ever shows up on the balance sheets of Target and Walmart and all these retail consumers, what do you think? So I, with you on the, you know, our perspective typically is like companies should try to, in, even in times of great growth, try to manage the growth with as low a kind of, you know, cogs or, or, or expenditures you can't, right? So you hire as few people, the minimum viable number of people to do the, the amount of work that you do and you don't overhire, say. But I feel like UPS as a business is a little different because... I get the impression that you would have to hire to, I, I mean, I, I guess I don't know the details on who's being laid off or wh wh what cohort it is, but if I'm, you know, if it is, you know, for, for example, delivery drivers and, and things like this, I don't know if they have an option except to scale up and scale down as demand moves up and down. I think it's the nature of the business. I don't know. That, what do you think? Just part of the business. It's just, is it a, a sign of what's coming for retail? I'm, I'm assuming retail keeps adjusting their numbers down. <laughs> so it's like they, they don't get caught slipping and it it doesn't look so bad but you know at some point like, you can tell the parking lots are less busy restaurants are less busy we keep talking about this it just took way longer than i ever thought well i never lived through this so i don't know i never lived through an economy getting six or seven trillion dollars pumped into it um we had no problem spending it i tell you like, there was times when you couldn't find a boat a jet ski an rv a car we bought it all. Right? We bought it all twice. Um, so I never seen that before, like, but it still took a long time to get the money out of the system. And I think now you're starting to see demand drop. So I don't know. I think the IMF just uh, upped the estimate for growth this year because of, of U.S. stability. And oh, again, really? this, we, yeah. we, we've toughed this one out, right? It's for now. It doesn't mean it's not going to crash later, but we were resilient to uh, an extent. I mean, I think who was it that said it on on one of the prior episodes? But does that mean that, from a policy standpoint, pumping the seven trillion in and yeah, okay, we had that thing where we spent a ton of money, but it, has it worked? Did it work? I'm gonna come back to that. I had one random thought. How many people do you think are listening to this? Actually, know what the All In podcast is? Oh, I hope all that. Yes, good point. No, but I, I see the traffic we're picking up on some of the episodes, and I realize this isn't all people from All In. It's people that came here for the book and the business podcast. And, you know, just FYI, there is a podcast out there called All In that's like a business and tech podcast that this is the after show. Like, we just talked about the episode. And right. I always wonder, like, man, how many, you know, they're, they only have like 400,000 subscribers. And you think mm -hmm. about how big the business content world is. Um, I was like, man, how many True. people actually know that they're what we're talking about sometimes? I'm sure some people listen to all in. But uh, anyways, going back to you saying, did it work? What yeah. if like every, every seven years they did this? You ever see the pump tracks on uh, like a BMX course? It's just, uh -huh. it's just roll. It's just rolling hills. And. You 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 go up over the hill, and as you're coming down the hill, you kind of you kind of sink into the bike, and as you're coming up, you kind of jump up. Mm. Google it sometime. Mm -hmm. They call it a pump track, and you can actually get around this track without ever pedaling. 
Mm. You're just using your body's momentum to come up and down and up and down. You can actually get going really damn fast. If you're a mountain bike, you can do something similar going through the whoops. Um, what if you could do economics that way? What if you like they, they pumped in a bunch of money? I know this is like terrible for as far as debt goes, but I have other opinions on that. If you pump a bunch of money in, you deal with this inflation that kind of, but you never have like these big crashes. Could they could they figure out with all the debt and all the things we're doing with the new economy? Could you have these like cycles of massive growth and then these like soft landings and then massive? But the end result is a hell of a lot of growth. I just made that up. But... No, I, I see your point though. But like, like you basically like grow your way out of the pain. Then when you start to feel the pain, you trigger like another stimulus such that you can grow yourself out of the pain, and you just keep doing that cycle. Yeah, I, I just made that up on the fly, but. <laughs> You know, I, I get to thinking, like, if we get through this without a major crash, it kind of opens up this whole new economic thing. And that's obviously an issue. Um, so what I just said probably doesn't make a lot of sense. But if if an economics professor said, if you told an economics professor this is what we're going to do in 2015, and then what they thought the outcome would be is, is probably far different than what actually happened right now. Um, it should have been like mega boom, mega bust. We've not seen the mega bust. And um, I'm curious to see what happens from there. You do get the sense, though, that as as long as, like a, on a contingency basis, as long as the U.S. is the reserve currency, as long as uh, our relative inflation is lower than the rest of the world, as long as, um, you know, certain economies are pegged to the U.S. dollar. Like, the, there's some like legitimacy to what you're saying because it, money flows kind of to the to the point of least resistance, right? Typically, and as long as the U.S. is the most kind of powerful place, biggest market, all that stuff. Like, it, there's a relativity part of this to where it, it might be true. It might be true that you know, as long as we're still bigger and better than everyone else, so to speak. Uh, you could float that that idea. I mean, uh, it's also the stability and the fact that we got the largest military in the world. It's people hate the. I mean, look, I wish we spent less money on the military too. Like, our, you know, <laughs> bring my taxes down, please. But at the same time, I like, think about where I grew up, and you realize the the muscle on the block. No, no one screwed with them, right? And you know, people tried sometimes. It wasn't smart. And um, somewhere in there between. Having this like great financial system, having the large military, the financial stability, and you know, how long does that last? I don't know. But as long as you got it, you can probably get away with a lot of stuff. Yeah, it's yeah. amazing what you can get away with when you know you're at least perceived as number one, and maybe that'll come back to bite us. But back to the layoffs. Um, at one point, they were talking about media riffs, uh, riffs or reduction in force for people that don't speak that language. Did you see the common denominator across the companies they were mentioning that were doing the media layoffs? I mean, uh, call it point of view, something like that? Point of view, but let's just say politically, many of the, the publications they were talking about leaned a certain way. Oh, did they? Yeah. And it's, I go back to, we've seen a lot of this happen where we keep making content that is, and they talk more about the, the truth of the service and lies of the service um, that Shamat was talking about. But instead of just giving people this like straightforward, like what the news is, everything was kind of twisted and very slanted. And you realize it's not really a business model and it makes certain people happy. But it's not it's not sustainable at, at any scale. Now, if you go back and play the episode, they're gonna they're, they're gonna read off a list of, you know, some of those publications. And I remember some of those publications writing things, and I'm like, did they really just print that? <laughs> and um, and you just realize at the end, it's it's not working, and people just want the news. We want honest news. I just want to know what happened. If you have the why, give me the why. 
but don't give me what you think the why is. And I think that's kind of the problem. Mm. So um, do you do you really believe that people like I think you do because you make decisions based on the information that you see in the world, right? You're, you're a different kind of level of thinking. But if it is, if it was true that people just wanted the news, then these businesses wouldn't like i feel like they just go where the do- like the eyeballs and the dollars are or maybe it's where the eyeballs first and then cuz the dollars follow and the eyeballs are showing you that they don't actually want people don't actually want the news what they want is this slanted thing that tells them what they want to hear i think if someone's going to keep serving it to them they're going to pick the source that tells them what they want to hear yeah, like you yeah. know, I I think about what I have to do every morning. Every morning, I have to open up CNN and Fox News and try to figure out between the two <laughs> where is the truth. Right. Now, there's probably twenty percent on the right that only want Fox News. There's twenty percent and only want CNN and or MSNBC or whatever. And I do think there's quite a people in the middle. It's like, can you just tell me what's going on? And but we've also created this environment where it's, um. Media companies continue to put stuff out that get the clicks, right? Twisting titles and words and context. And I guess it goes both ways because, you know, you're saying if people only wanted the news, then the the news companies would do it and they would make money. The problem is everyone they listed was slanted a certain way and that failed too. So maybe the news is just meant to go out of business. Yeah, that's that's actually a good point. Yeah, that's true. um, But, you know, you... You you can't like just end up serving content to these small factions and have a large company and think it's going to be a sustainable business model in the long run. And I think you've seen it reflected in a lot of, of movies and other things. It's just I I don't want some like you know how to fix society or a political message in every piece of media I consume. I can't sometimes I just want to watch a movie and laugh. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Like I. And you, you've seen that hit a lot of, um, of Hollywood and it's obviously hit the media too. But when you look at the media, it's that narrative. We talk about the narrative, right? How many positive pieces do you ever see about companies like culture and workforce? Mm, it's rare. It's rare. Everything is terrible companies, greedy companies, terrible managers, micromanagers, like, um, Every, every, almost every piece of media you ever watch on uh, TV is how bad the company is, how terrible the boss is, how dumb the boss is, how the boss makes you work on Christmas. And man, at some point you got to say, you know, people aren't that dumb. And you're watching this. It's like, I'm tired of this. Yeah. And then you're watching these media publications because they'll, they'll give you a title and then you click on it. Right. And there's, there's, there's a couple, I'm not going to name publications, but. You click on it, and then you read it. I'm like, well, that's not what happened. Well, it doesn't matter. You you clicked on it, and they had four ads on that thing. <laughs> and then they got their ad revenue, and it's... That that killed a lot of things. Okay, like, people used to just get the newspaper. And it was it was the news. And, um... You know, um, car caught on fire at you know xyz street and because it hit a telephone pole but today it would be like you know car car on fire because you know gasoline prices are too high like i don't know like <laughs> they everything's always twisted and out of context like uh, like i don't know what's true anymore unless i watch it come out of somebody's mouth and that's the media and then do you want to pay for that? No. No. I, uh... Like, you know how many, like, hit pieces were done on people just because they, like, leaned a certain way? Right. Like, I, do you want to pay for a publication because this is, this is what we have time for? There's so much news going on in this world. And then you're going to go do a hit piece on someone because you don't like them politically? I just... Yeah, you're probably going to go out of business, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, to be honest, I, I I cut the cord on basically all television about a year ago. And um, o- only because I, I just started to feel like the only thing that I would really have on the TV is, is the news channels like, like you. But the 
it, I just felt like, you know, you watch anything and it's the same. For one, it's the same story that, that gets like 80 times in a 24 hour span. And then it's a slanted same story for 80 times in a 24 hour time span. And it just became like tiring and boring. And I guess I don't know what I'm where I'm going with that. But I, all, all, I say that to just say that the, I, I do feel like the model is broken. I mean, the the model's broken in the new world. And I don't know how you monetize it from here. Well, I think the one of the best examples is, is maybe something like the BBC in the UK where you, you probably have to um, kind of make it a public good, have the government fund it a little bit, but try and pull out the, I don't know if you can, but you get the sense that at least it's it's not as, as slanted. Do you feel the NPR is not slanted? Oh, that's the most slanted. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's uh, that's a good we... point. Actually, <laughs> it takes it takes discipline, and I guess it just takes people wanting to. I go back to the initial point, which is the uh, what does the news and the media really? What is its true purpose? I feel like you consume information in order to make decisions, and if you like. You, we just have the cyclical thing with society. You point to the media and say that it's definitely the media's fault. To where, if people are making decisions based on these things that are so slanted with their point of view, then how do you expect people to make good decisions? And then, if if two, you know, back they were saying that the news used to be so boring, but at least then people would make the same decision based based on the the things that are put in front of them, right? Because there typically is one one good decision, say, based on a bit of information. But I, you just can't do that now. You just you, I think the media has created this really polarized society for us. When they say like opt ed, what is you might I don't even know. Like what is what when you see opt ed, what do you think of that? I think of an opinion piece. I think of an opinion piece. And I think what I've witnessed is opinion has creeped into everything. Yeah. Right. It's, the whole thing is an op ed. The whole Forking thing is an opt ed now. And, you know, they talked about many people on both sides, right and left, like getting into media to be more activist than, than journalists. And it's, I just need, back to, I just need the news. It's, I need to know a bomb hit here. You can't tell me the bomb hit there. The bomb hit here because the administration did, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, you know, it's, there's way too much what I feel or what I think or, or just what I want you to believe in, in the news anymore. And it's, it's everywhere though. It's like social, it's on TV, it's in things you read everywhere. And it's like, everything's an opt-ed now. Nothing is like real journalism. And if it is journalism, it's like I said, we're doing hit pieces and, and we're going out after people in, in the name of journalism. Like this is investigative journalism trying to sink X, Y, Z person, because we know you don't ever do that to the other to the other political party you only you only target these people and it's that i don't yeah it's not a sustainable business model yeah like let's just say the companies the country split 50 50 okay you, maybe 50 percent of people want to see that but maybe only 10 percent are going to pay for it and you're finding out it doesn't work um good yeah. luck yeah but you know the chamoff's a couple nice ones are lies as a service yeah. And and like the truth as a service, and they're trying to figure out how to like commoditize the truth. And it's like Jesus Christ, it's 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 this this is the issue. We can't just report the news. We can't just report the truth. And you know, Kane, you're a writer. You know how easy it is to take the same sentence, change two words, and have the meaning completely changed. Yeah. And like the manipulation that goes on just by word selection is nuts. But I'm listening to these guys talking about having to commoditize the truth, and it's like. Well, this is why everything's so screwed up. No one actually knows the truth. And where do you go from there? And they talked about, you know, these, these, I mean, who, who, who they mentioned, like the, if you got these celebrities, like it was a Rachel Maddow or, or Ben Shapiro, I think they mentioned where you kind of have this like articulate, charismatic type of person delivering the news that becomes the brand. And a lot of these other publications didn't have this like figurehead. So now people are going and listening to these people directly because you can't, you can't turn into one of the newspapers. They don't have that. And it's like, well, 
the problem is now we're gonna go we're gonna go direct to this person, but that person's probably not giving you the straight answer either. You know, we talked about having like this figurehead of your brain. If you don't have a figurehead of your brain, how do you survive these days? It's true. It, I mean, it's true. How do you differentiate right, without somebody that people buy from people? Right? There's always that kind of idea. People buy from people, and who's your person on the media side? Right. Right. I hope you're not asking me actually, but <laughs> right. No, I'm not asking you directly. It's just making the point of there's people out there that, you know, maybe maybe Rachel Maddow is your person, or maybe it's Tucker. And I, don't, I just don't know if that's solving a problem either. So we're going to skip major publications or major news channels to go direct to these people, you know, to their Twitter accounts or their blog or their Substack. And But now we're bypassing everything. And you're really just going to, you're right back to still only consuming content that is one giant opt-ed. Right. Right. But ain't getting any better from here, man. No. They were talking about Google. How, you know, how do, how do you rank these sources and how do you figure out the problem? And, you know, Google can be manipulated. That's what, that's what SEO is all about. And it's like, well, the more links into something doesn't mean it's more authoritative or more correct. And, you know, how many times have you, you're, you're, I'm searching for something and Google gives me Angie's List, Yelp, um, Thumbtack. Like, I, I'm not looking for a list. I'm not looking for Angie's List. I'm. I'm looking for a plumber in Michigan, right? And <laughs> page, rank, page rank works to an extent, but it's flawed, you know, just like everything else is. And, you know, we joked about in the past about doing a site that literally just had news headlines and nothing else, you know, yeah. two bombs hit warship in, in Yemen. Like, I don't, I don't know, like, and just get people informed and and stop all the stop all the opinion and the political manipulation and the activism on both sides of the fence just tell me what happened i why is that so hard it is hard because i know if i get you to click on this i can get some ad revenue so i don't know that like yeah, you said yeah. the thing's broken I agree. And actually, if you think about Google Page, right, that might actually be part of the, if you look at like the, what do you call it, like the root cause of all the, the issues that we see, it may actually be something like that. Because, I mean, to, to your point, to their point, the sites that get the most inbound links, which is like kind of a popularity contest, well, the things where you're saying the things that people want to hear are probably going to be more popular, which means you're going to write the things that people want to hear, etc. You know, one of the businesses that we're involved in, it, I, I think it's always been an uphill climb because we try to tell the truth on certain things and it you, you, it just doesn't really work from an SEO standpoint. I mean, it, like you can't really optimize that hard. No, like if we did a piece of content that said, you know, work hard, have ambition, you know, how to get ahead in your career and then people don't want to hear that. Right, play the long game, something like that, right? No, play the no long chance. game, yeah. Versus the article that says, you know, how to work four-hour days and tell your boss to piss off. Yeah, yeah. Like everyone will pile links into that thing, and that's going to, you know, we can, we can debate those two topics, but I would, I would say most people would agree that if you want to get ahead, our advice would be, you know, but it's, that's not what would get the links. Right. And that's what happens across the board is the things that people want to hear get the most credit and um hell no one wants the truth anymore who was it sax um i always mix up jack sax and jake Cal. sax was saying i have to try triangulate the truth and if you think about what that means like why is it so difficult i got to go to three different sources and kind of like you got a GPS in my hand and a compass. Like, why to try to figure out <laughs> what is the truth? That you can't, it's that hard. Like I said, I opened up yeah. my morning routine CNN, Fox, CNBC. If something really interests me, I'll try to maybe I'll find an AP or Reuters, which even they mentioned that's not 
unbiased these days. And somewhere in there, I just have to figure out what's going on. If, if it's something I'm concerned about. Um, on top of the fact, you know, the, the things the news sites d d decide to report on is nuts. Like you, you can see their bias just on the things they choose to report on. So I can't even get the whole news. I, I used to be able to go to CNN a long time ago and say, I'm, I'm going to understand what's going on in the world. I don't, that's not the truth anymore. Yeah. Yep. So, I, uh, it just shouldn't be that hard to get the truth, but it is. What's next? Uh, Border issue. <laughs> <laughs> I, I laugh because, you know, Sachs jumps in and goes, um, Jay Cal keeps running interference on the subject. And if you remember from prior episodes, every time they try to talk about the numbers, Jay Cal's always defending the numbers of the administration on the border mm, issue. I do remember this here. Or that the numbers, they don't have accurate numbers or, or something like that. The numbers that, aren't that, believable. And that, my thing is, like, I, I think Sachs is very transparent on who he is. He can, you know which way he leans. You, you know how he feels on a subject before it even comes up. And you feel that way about Jay Cal most of the time, but there's other times when he tries to, like, disguise what he's doing. And I hate that about people. <laughs> We know you you lean that way, right? And then I hate when you start making excuses and trying to justify because your your team's taking an L. Uh, if that's what you believe, then step up and just say it, right? Just say, I'm going to defend them because this is who I vote for. And I, I don't understand why people do that. They just do. Um, you shouldn't feel guilty, right? Like, he shouldn't feel guilty about having the... You know, everybody's allowed... Uh, their own uh, perspective and opinion. They're, you're allowed to root for whatever team you, you know you want, but it's true. Like the way he he gets defensive. I mean, it was like the first time where he seemed to say, like, "I haven't finished my point" or something. You know, like you know, when people get that, it means that defenses are up. I I I particularly don't like the people that. It's like I'm not even sure you believe in this, but you feel you have to defend this. Or you, you take on arguments you often don't even believe in because this is your team. Yeah, identity politics. Yep. And I, I just don't like that. And um and Sachs does it too. But Sachs is one of those people that I may disagree with, with with some of the things he says, but you know where he stands. And like sometimes I feel like Jay Cal's trying to cover it up and like he mentioned like running the interference and I think like we know where you're at. Just stop. Just stop. Yeah, you know it's because it would kill him to say this border is a goddamn nightmare because he he doesn't want to say anything negative about his team, right? And what I'm seeing is more and more people, regardless of what political side came, they're not happy with what's going on at the border. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I I found that funny. It's but I do I do see like in in general in the world that that's what people do is they'll they will start taking up arguments just for the sake of that, that I'm supposed to. And they don't even believe it. Right. Well, that's not helping us either, right? <laughs> it's, uh, I, I had someone tell me, like, the border thing was the first time they thought, the border's gotten so bad that this is the first time they thought that Biden was going to lose. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. It makes sense. There's so yeah. many implications to the border. I mean, I'm not super informed <laughs> on the border. No, no, I'll stop my point in a second, Jess. But, the, like... It, there's so many implications, and uh, I, I think of all the, the economy, jobs, all these things, but personal safety or whatever, I think is, is pretty, you know, it, it's pretty important. <laughs> I'm obviously not that informed on the border. It's, I know we've seen a tremendous amount of, of more homeless on the streets in Michigan. We, I mean, talking like 10x than I've ever seen in my life. And um, I told you that the, the shocking one to me was I, I get off at... I forgot what exit is, but I, I, I sneak in the back way when I go into Chicago. I, I come in through Chinatown and go down to State Street. And um, I turned on to, I don't know if it's State Street or the street before State Street. And the police station's right there, and it's just lined with tents. I, wow, of all my years of coming here, I've never seen anything like this. And then as I'm going down State Street, there's just people just hanging out on the streets with two little babies wrapped in blankets, leaning up against the post and the streets lined with it. And I'm like, man, what the hell's going on? And, um, I, I look back and make people made fun of Trump for the wall. 
like that was a that was his big thing and in some weird way what's that eight years later it that's a thing come full circle because what you know people thought maybe he was making a big deal out of something that wasn't there last you know whatever 2016 and now yeah. it's literally it's literally the thing in in the crosshairs of what may or may not win an election right now yeah yeah. Of all the stuff, the economy, the wars, and all that stuff, it's the border has really become the issue. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, anyways, it's just, you know, I wish you'd just hear J. Cal go like, man. All right, so we talked about this before, but J. Cal's point is, I think he was trying to look at the data and say that the interactions, I don't want to put words in a guy's mouth. I can't remember the episode word for word. I want to say he was talking about the interactions were down, not down, but they weren't significantly up or something, blah, blah, blah. But look, if, if you're at a saturation point where you have 100,000 Border Patrol, they can only handle so many interactions. So there, if the interaction's 5X, or I mean, if the amount of people coming over 5X, right, and they can only handle up to 2X, the 3X never gets, it never gets registered because they never had an interaction. So I think that was like a, a a poor argument for especially guys that are supposed to like know a tremendous amount of math and all this stuff. It's the interactions are down because you they're just you can't. I'm one person. I got two people in my hands, right? And there's ten running by me. Like <laughs> interactions are going to be they're not going to go up five x unless unless you five x border patrol too. So I don't know if that was a fair argument. I mean, when you if you recall the the chart too, the the way that like I hate charts where they stack year on year lines on top of each other because you lose perspective on when this thing started and where it is now. And I think um, Friedberg called it out because Jake Howe was looking at two points on the line where they intersect and saying, like, "Look, last year they were about even," but if you track back to like where the the lowest line started, I mean. It, the 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 rise from like the start of the chart if you drew the line out in one big line to where it is today is just in, like an enormous rise um but it's like i i just remember that thinking about that line, the the chart itself because i've seen lots of charts like that that are deceiving i just hate, i hate all charts that are is it a line chart those yeah. like the one you talked about the stacking and the multicolors and it's just i need i need to see years and then or, or you know, months and years, and it showed me the, the dots going across. And yeah, exactly. It's it's so easy to try to convince people that you're looking at something that's not there. So, did you see when the date was? I was driving when I listened to the episode. I, I, I yeah, as was I. I don't really remember. I think it was it, like, if I remember right, it would be years. So, give it a couple years back. That would be like where the first line started, if I remember right. So, if you compare, like, call it two years, three years, four years ago to where it is today, that rise is is enormous. When or if what, what, what J. Cal I think was pointing out was like if you compare, you know, six months back to today, like they intersect somehow, and I don't know, I I don't remember the chart exactly, but but we know like post COVID, this is the problem. Yeah, 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 yeah for sure. Yeah, I I didn't look at the chart, but it it has seemed they gotten worse in the last you know six months. Um, but maybe it's just been continuous, but um. Like, it's a lot. But, you know, good old J. Cal. And hey, I don't, don't get me wrong. Sax was the same crap. I just, I never once ever, ever questioned where Sax is just, he's not trying to hide it. Like, he's, you know, exactly. And I, where, I, yeah. but, and I wonder if you, if you like take what we talked about earlier and you, because we're, we're taking information from two sources here. If we triangulate, maybe the truth is somewhere in the middle. I don't know. Yeah, it probably is, but I mean, at the end of the day, it just, it seems like we have way too many people coming over the borders. And, um, yeah, yeah, it's, so on that note, um, Shamath was like, I, I, we talked about more, more stuff we talked about in the past. We talk a lot about if, you know, if you're going to give, you know, free school loans or, or do this or spend this money, like, why isn't the government going, we're, we're, we're expecting a, a 200,000, you know, person shortage in nursing. We're going to put money towards that. Go go get a nursing degree. We'll pay for it. Or, 
we're we're a hundred thousand. We're gonna be a hundred thousand short in welders. We're gonna create a program for that. Like we don't look down the maybe we do, and I don't know about it. it doesn't seem to be very transparent. I see a lot of government run TV ads, and I never see stuff like this. Looking down the thing and saying these are the things that we're gonna be short on in the next five to ten years. Let's put the money and resources to get people educated on these topics and go fill these roles that we need filled. And well, it doesn't seem like we're doing that. Well, Tremont was taking the same thing of with immigration. It's like, let's look at how many people do you think we need to let in next year? What type of people do we need to let in next year? And then where do they need to go? You just can't let them all. You can't let 2 million people flood into Texas. Like, or, North Dakota is drilling. We need some people to go, you know, work the oil fields. And who has that skill? We don't have the skills that generally, like, taking this approach from, and which I would expect from the government, this is what we should be doing. It's, we need X amount of engineers. We need this many people to do this. And we need these people to go up to Maine. And we need people to go out to, you know, out west and, and work in the forest. And does it sound like we're putting that much thought into our immigration policy? Uh, I, this is kind of Kane perspective one on one. We just don't fix issues, right? Like as a, as a society here, and I think part part of the reason is because you know we we talked about this before, but the like the government is very good at like building layers of bureaucracy such that decisions don't get made. But I think you make an interesting point, or Chamath made a good point too about you know there will be a day where the problem I think uh, is so dire that something will change, right? And But that also, so to say, okay, we need 200,000 engineers, let's go get 200,000 engineers. Right? And, but there's a contingency there, which is we cannot wait as a country to so long to make that decision because there's a contingency that people need to want to come here. And if we do, we continue kind of on the path that we're going where like, uh, I, think it, I think it's even clear with tourism, right? Like people just don't travel here as much as they used to, I think. Um, or at least Europe, I think, is like that. But we can't. I guess we, uh, my point is, we can't wait so long to to get this right um, that people stop wanting to come here uh, because that's. I think that's a big deal. No, and you look at what other places in the world are doing to attract talent. The things they're building. The this may not be the most attractive place to come to. Look at our airports, right? Look at the highways. Like, uh, I mean, I. I love the city, but like if if you were coming from a different country and you landed in like Chicago airport and then drove into the city, I mean, it, until you get to the city, it's 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 not a it's not a nice look. Didn't Elon want to build a tunnel from O'Hare to downtown? Yeah, it makes sense. It. I gotta say, Detroit's got a nice airport. We won. Like, yeah, yeah, seriously, seriously. The, the DTW is clean. Like, it's a nice. We killed it on the airport. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. But but there's time. But most of the time I drive out to Chicago because um, by the time I you know get even with a valet, I do clear, pre-check. I can get in and out pretty quick. And you know the flight, but the problem is by the time you get to O'Hare, it's an hour drive to get to the city, yeah. and it's not an hour drive. It's just the traffic sucks so bad, and it's. God, having some kind of like fast rail that's just no stop downtown would make so much sense. Mm -hmm. I will never invest in that though. It's we got to put more charging stations in and heated sidewalks and stuff. I don't know, but uh, <laughs> it's um, yeah, you know, you're the thing you always say. We just don't. Not only you say we're not good at fixing problems, you say we don't fix. We just don't <laughs> fix the problem. <laughs> right. But Chamath had the approach that I would have myself. It's what I always talk about in terms of jobs. It's okay. We're short on nurses. Let's figure out how to get a program to get nursing degrees. Let's get the media out there to encourage people. Like, we'll do it for the army. You know, come join the army. They'll run TV commercials. Like, come get a nursing degree on us. We're not looking at how to fill these gaps, right? We're also not doing that with the immigration policy. If you look at, like, in... I don't know if it's like Singapore, you look at places in Europe, it's, if you have like a technical, technical expertise, you can get a visa pretty easy. But they're, they're looking at like, well, what value are you bringing to the country? Um, we're just 
people are coming like it's an economic opportunity isn't the same as seeking asylum right 100 percent, of course and i think that's kind of the mix right now and i don't know anyone that's like i have this might be my own circle i don't know anyone personally that's like close the border never let anyone in ever again it's why can't we look and say hey we need x amount of labor we need x amount of tech we need this let's vet them let's get them in and let's go let's go I mean, I feel like lots of countries have done immigration well, and when we're here in the states, kind of the biggest, baddest country in the world, like I feel like we should be able to solve this one. You know, we don't because it's become a political thing. And yeah, weren't they talking about a theory about if you know twenty million people are quote unquote illegal and what they said? Yeah, right, right. The number is staggering. And then if they end up. Um, figuring out a way to get them voting rights that how it would basically screw up elections forever. Right. Jay Cal was once again trying to argue that no, no, maybe it'd be 50-50 Democrats, Republicans. <laughs> um, and, and you don't know. I think the number might surprise you. I don't, I don't think it would be all Democrat. But um, yeah, I, they, make it, they made a good point though, which would be whatever administration let you in is probably the one that you'll stick to at least for one cycle. And you can do a lot of damage in one cycle if you have the presidency and Congress. As we've seen. <laughs> As we've seen. So it's, um, and it's hard to say, but, you know, is that a, I, I just, I never understood the why of having the open border in, in this way. And I, I do feel like the taxpayers, should, should you not have a, you pay property taxes, they never go away. And like you pay federal taxes, you should you not have a say in, in your community and the cost that you're going to have to, there's all these things that it's almost like we have no say in anymore. And um, I don't understand the point of that unless you have some political motivation. Yeah. Yeah. But well said. I don't know. It's like we have no say in anything anymore. <laughs> It does feel that way. Yeah, it does feel that way. Let's go down the notes. Oh, so they were talking about, you know, open the floodgates, bring in a bunch of people, labor's going to get cheaper. So let's just say their, their number that they said is true and 20 million people, I'm not going to, you know, say illegals, but people came here. Has labor gone down? <laughs> no. Oh, it's not. Like, Nothing I'm, uh, nothing I am in mean, labor's gone down. But on that same sense, when they say that, I'm like, well, if you think about it, Kane, it's you want labor to go down, but everything's really expensive. I think wages need to go up right now because everything's so expensive. So what you're really saying is these people aren't even going to be able to live unless you pack like 10 people in a house. It's like so, something they said didn't sit right with me. I'm not saying that they meant that, but the, the the concept of bringing more labor so labor cost goes down. But you can't even live on today's wages, so could you imagine less wage? Mm, uh, I completely agree. And maybe like even more fundamental is the, the you got to <laughs> like you got to think of the 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 kinds of like the skills that the people who are coming in. Um, like what kind of immigration is 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 happening? The the kind of the the point in the workforce that they're going to be entering, like, and is there actual like fluctuation in the price at at the places that? Do you know what I mean? Like at the entry point of these individuals into the workforce, like where are they entering, and then what is the price at that point? Because if we're saying like, okay, people that are making one hundred fifty grand a year, for example, um, is this the kind of people that that are, that are coming over the border or coming over the border? There isn't. I just don't think that 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 argument makes any sense, um, unless you're saying we have kind of true open borders across the entire up and down of the the corporate ladder. Say, I think they're talking more about like general labor, the, the low end jobs and that type of stuff. So you know, what is it, fifteen an hour, twenty an hour? Like those jobs have a price, and it's not. I don't. Th they just get filled in at that price. I feel like I don't think more competition at that level means that the price goes down to ten an hour. But even if it goes down to ten an hour, then how do you live? That's. I mean, absolutely, absolutely. That that yeah. was my problem of okay, labor goes down, but you can't even live on today's labor number, even if. And I know on paper, the economist is going to say, "Well, labor goes down, prices go down." 
Like we just talked about sub zero refrigerators being twenty grand or something. <laughs> Do you think that price is, I've never seen some stuff come down? Yeah. Things just a lot of things don't come down. And it's it just you know sound good in theory, but it doesn't it doesn't seem to work that way. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, what else we have? I have a note that says twenty two million video clip. But I don't know what that was. Yeah, I don't remember. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like I'm trying to take these notes. Some of them was viewed twenty two million times. I'm gonna go back and look now. Shamath on the, the self loathing part was interesting. You mentioned that too. Yeah. Yeah. I, no, I don't exactly remember the point anymore, but it, it something about. Uh, were they talking about the left? I think they were talking about, the, was it the left? And then I, I, we've talked about this before, but when you reach a certain level of, of privilege, and I think most, it like, you know, most people that, that have grown up in, in, in America and the West, like have, have reached a level of privilege, right? Like we, we cannot compare the way that we live. $30,000 a year here seems like absolutely nothing, but you know, that goes a long way in other countries in the world. And I think you get to a place where once, uh, once you don't feel like you deserve the things that you have, then you, I think that was the point that Chamath was making. Then you make interesting decisions from a societal standpoint around what do you fund? What do you, go get behind when you don't feel like you've earned the things that you, you, you have. I don't know. It's interesting. Well, it's all loathing part. I just, I've, I've come across people in my life like this and well-educated, usually have a graduate degree or you know, them and their spouse both have graduate degrees or PhDs and they start, they start thinking that everybody needs their help, but some of them actually don't want to really help. Right. It's, Somewhere it's either the self loathing or maybe they feel guilty or they do they just feel it's the right thing to do and I uh, not everyone needs the help. Right? It's um and it's not even help sometimes, Kane. Sometimes it's just what 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 do they call it? Virtue signaling or something, or this is mm-hmm. this is what I gotta show the world so they don't look bad upon me and I uh Yeah, it was interesting to hear Chamath mention that because it is something I've witnessed that you know you've done so well that you think you know i gotta go help this person and like that person doesn't need your help they're doing they're on the right path right they're smart they're smart they're motivated they're ambitious it's they may they may not be where you are um but not everybody's looking for a handout not everyone's looking for a handout man and uh they don't but the problem is they treat everyone like that and i think that's kind of where things go south that's yeah that's a good point like just because they're not where you are doesn't mean, you know, everything stacked against them. Okay, there's been a lot of people in my life that they were really down on their luck, and it wasn't because the system was stacked against them. It's because they did some stupid shit, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> like, not once, not twice. You try to give them advice, they screw up. You try to help them some more, and they screw up. And it's like, this is causality. I got family like that, <laughs> right? Like, I mean, you, you know. It's uh, just funny how that works out. Yeah. Fintech yeah. margins. Okay. 70, 80% they were talking about or something. Ugh. There's a lot of margin talk. I don't remember exactly about Fintech. I don't either. I just, I, I have a note that says, uh, SAS margins are amazing. <laughs> I got SAS margins are amazing. We need a piece of this. So, <laughs> So it must have been a big, it wasn't like 30, 40%. I want to say they mentioned like 70, 80% is what a normal SAS, something, blah, blah, blah. But yeah, with, yeah, at, at the gross level, that makes sense. But at the, at the new, in the new world, it costs so much money to get a customer now that those margins are all getting smashed. Like you used to go on, be able to go on Facebook and I think places like Dropbox and when they were scaling, they were, they were running ads everywhere and spending a crazy amount of money to acquire a customer. But over time, it would pay off. But now the uh, cost to acquire customers so much mm-hmm. that it's actually hard to make that math work because everything's so saturated. Uh, but seven, eighty percent margin sounds amazing. Like, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, I, I yeah, you're right. I mean, the, those margins because because the marginal cost to deliver another instance of whatever SaaS product you know, it's typically nothing, right? So you're just factoring in a labor cost, and I think that's also a big factor too as labor has gone up. As labor prices gone up, the margins have been starched out as well. 
I also think that they mentioned on another old podcast that with AI and how the cost of laying codes coming down, that, you know, what other competitors, it's not going to, if you had to rebuild Salesforce today, it's not going to cost you as much. Yeah, exactly. Because you don't need as many heads to, to do the same amount of code and it's, will we, will we see some more competitive products out there? Um, just because, I mean, you, you know, you talked about using AI to do some web stuff and how much time it saves and it's, it's kind of nuts. I, I, I'll ask you this question is because you have a, you have a tech background, but with the AI stuff, um, I, I completely agree that the, anything that already exists can be done cheaper, right? So Salesforce, you could probably recreate that, but is there still a place for innovation? Because you still have to know in order for me to, to go and Call it, call it rebuild Salesforce. I, like I need to be able to see what I'm building, ask AI to say, hey, can you build me this piece, this piece, this piece, put it all together. But if I don't know what I'm building, um, I kind of even AI can't help me figure out if I don't know what it is I'm building. So like from a tech standpoint, is there still value in, in being able to create something new? I mean, there is, but at the same time, it, I look at, uh, can you just make the things we have better? How many great UX experiences have you had? It, yeah, it's rare. Oh, it's really rare. And it's, you know, even Salesforce, I don't enjoy using it. <laughs> like most of the software systems I have to like pay a monthly recurring fee for. I don't love the interfaces. They're often not intuitive. You get used to it. So I, you know, innovation in, in the sense of just ease of use, something that's just, more convenient I, I I do think there's opportunity there and mm -hmm. um and plus you know like real innovation but god man just give me a product that is simple and it works well that is just easy i feel like nothing in the SaaS world is ever easy that's true thank uh that's nuts we gotta get this one wrapped up here yeah. we got the last one arc storm let's just wrap you know finish on that one okay um the West needs rain, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> you wanted rain, like, look, they had a, you know, they had a wet season last year. They got the reservoirs up. Um, I'm curious, you know, this is all prediction, but, you know, will it happen again this year? But look, they said the arc storm happened 150 years ago too, and that's kind of like before, you know, the uh, industrial was just going on and. It, it, you don't know, like, what the hell does the next hundred years look like? Um, things go in cycles. And then can we really make the determination, are, are we in a cycle? Or if we, if we cause this, how much of this did we cause? But this, this shit was going on 150 years ago. So, but the problem is they're saying it's going to happen more often. But we don't know that until it actually happens more often. Mm, right. We need to say it's happening more often or something like that. Right? It's happened more often. This is like, we make so many predictions and um, it doesn't mean the, that the general thought is wrong. I think we should try to keep the environment clean, the air clean. I don't think we want to cook the planet. But a lot of our projections are just not right. Yeah. And it's, and the problem is you don't know until it doesn't happen or it does happen. And that's the only way we can verify this stuff. And it's all, otherwise we have these models and, um, we can't predict the weather on most days. <laughs> like it's, you know, they, they need rain. It's, uh, it's a good thing. Let's get the reservoirs popped up, but listening to that and they're talking about all they're, all you're really saying is that it's predicted to happen more often. It's like, well, when do we prove that? Yeah, yeah. Because um, they said it happened 150 years ago, and it's supposed to happen every 150 years, and it's it's supposed to happen now, so that sounds like normal. But if you're saying every 150 years, you're telling me if you went back 300 years from now, we were tracking this kind of data? Yeah, good point. I guess another good correl correlation or, or like proxy is like vol volcanic explosions. I, I know nothing about this stuff, right? So I'm, I'm really, you know, just just saying something here. But the 
for as long as I can remember, like haven't we always been waiting for like a big volcanic or a big earthquake around like uh, Japan and all those areas, and it just I, just doesn't seem to happen. When I was growing up, they talked about California falling that's off right, the ocean. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. But it probably will at one point because you ever see the maps of what the world was like, whatever, five thousand years ago, and we were like one giant landmass or something. <laughs> yeah, the believe it or, or it's called. <laughs> believe it or not, <laughs> shit changes that we have no control over. At one point, there was a land bridge where you could walk, you know, over the Russia. And we went through, you know, two ice ages, and we have continent, the, 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 the continents drift. And, like, I, I realize as we, as we get smarter, we just... I, I do believe two things can be right at the same time. I think we should be trying to do a better job with the environment. But I think it's also true that things are changing whether you want them to or not. Yeah, I, I like that perspective. Two things can be true at once. And we we think that we are going to stop all change. And we are not. I, we're going to do a better job of not, you know, doing self-inflicted harm to the environment, which we're going to pay a price for. But if you think another volcano is not going to pop or, you know, the the plates are not going to continue to shift and the, the sun's going to keep beating on us or an asteroid's going to hit us or weather patterns aren't going to... Uh, the only thing that, other than taxes around this place, change is it's inevitable. Yeah. And my, my biggest issue is we are very resistant to change. It, it's who moved my cheese environment edition. We think nothing's going to change. And instead of preparing for it, we think we're going to try to stop it and control it. We can only control the effect we have. The rest of this shit's going to happen whether you like it or not, Kane. Yeah. Good like, point. Maybe that's why all the billionaires are building bunkers. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, till the next one. All right.